How y'all doing today? Ooh, yeah, it's still waking up. There's coffee across the hall if you guys haven't seen that yet. Uh, before I introduce your awesome first speaker of the day, a couple things. So, I don't know if you can tell from the keynote, but uh, we blew up capacity expectations. Uh, as you can see, we're almost hitting standing room only in here. Track one is also full. And that to track three looks similar. So the reason I bring this up is that lunch is catered by barbecue joint. I'm a KC native. I'm out in Columbia now. But I know how much we all love barbecue. Thing is, there's going to be a limited amount of barbecue. So we're not exactly telling you how much portions to take. But we would ask you to use the DBAD philosophy, which if you're not familiar, it's don't be a dick. <laughs> so, take, take a bit of food, you know, get, get a bit of a fill, but make sure you leave some for your fellow man and woman, and then after you see most people go up, if there's seconds available, sure, go for it then, but just so you know, we are going to be a little bit maybe thin on the barbecue, so yeah, watch out for that. Uh, how many of us in here have blinky electronic badges with stuff soldered on them? Okay, how many of us know about the game that goes on with that badge? Not many. Okay, so you might have noticed when you turned it on originally, you had these lights going across, and man, you got a lot of it lit up, Adam. I'm about to, I'm about to ask you some questions later. Uh, so these will light up as you find what we call foxes around the building. So this is to encourage you to walk around the building, find little areas. There's little devices hidden around. Maybe some of the devices are on the back of these badges. You notice you've got a little ESP8266 12F on here. This is your first time digging around with ESP8266 devices. Welcome to the next rabbit hole that you'll be dealing with for a year or two. These are awesome little devices. Uh, if you have questions and need more explanation on this or how to proceed, let me know. I'd be happy to talk to you about it in uh, the future. But we are at that time to get started. So, Aaron Riley, I've known this cat for a while. He is also a Columbia native. This is how much we love the Kansas City community. We come out here all the time because this is where you know the folks are at. Unfortunately, in Missouri, we don't have a whole lot of folks, uh, but we have an awesome community in here. So, uh, Aaron's been doing it big for the past couple of years in Columbia, and he's here to share a bit more knowledge with you today, this time on the study of botnets. Surprise, surprise, there's a lot of assholes on the internet, and they're not all real people. So with that, Aaron, take it away, my man. Thank you very much. Welcome, friends. Uh, I'm glad that he was able to tell you about the barbecue. Uh, it is really good, so I pull out a little bit. But today we're going to talk about pulling out the strand of the botnet web. I am Aaron Riley. Here's a little bit about me. I have a couple of degrees I'm working on a bachelor's right now. I have a couple of certs in InfoSec. That doesn't really matter. What really matters is I have a wife named Sam. I have a son named Jeff, he's a newborn. I'm a bit of a sci-fi nerd, so I need Teal and Daniel to have a Stargate team. Woo! Woo! So I am originally from Kansas City, moved to Columbia for a girl, my wife. And uh, you know, always go cheese. So Get this started. We need to briefly go over what a botnet is. I mean, briefly, because I understand a lot of you understand what it is, but we're going to get on some terminology expectations. We're going to discuss what botnets are and how they're strung together communication and architecture. Right? We're going to go through how a botnet spreads, and that's the propagation method, and there's a couple of ways of doing that. We're going to look at what an infection could be and what it could look like in different scenarios. <coughs> After seeing what an infection is, we're going to look at how to mitigate and remediate that infection. So we're going to play around a little bit with it as well. Then you need to know the three Ps, and those are a cycle stage that helps maintain and mitigate your uh, network resources. So uh, just to briefly go over what a botnet is, we're going to go over the terms of vocabulary. So we have a collective base of when I use a term, you understand it's a different term that you use, but it's the same thing. We're going to go over the generic types of botnets, and then to really put it all together, we're going to talk about a real life scenario. Emotet Giotto, the banking Trojan. And every time I'm going to go through what a botnet does here, I'm going to relate it to a real life botnet that's actually active and we research it quite a bit. So, your terms of vocabulary. Uh, what we're looking at here is a, a botnet is just a collection of zombies that's controlled by a command control structure that is uh, owned by the bot master. I'm sure a lot of you understand that. I typically call a command and control structure C2. I typically call a zombie a bot. Uh, there's all these different things that I talk about, but we're going to go the base knowledge here. Uh, the bot master is the person that 
make sure of the maintaining and propagation of the infection. Propagation just means how does it spread? There's a couple of different methods, and we'll go over that in a minute. So when we're talking about botnets, we need to talk about a couple of generic types of botnets. Now, I'm sure you guys all understand, but to put, put it into perspective, I've added the actual bots that kind of go into these categories. Now, all these botnets aren't going to specifically fit into this. They can overlap a couple of different ways in the different areas that are in there. But when we're talking about spam botnets, Necker's comes to mind. In the last three months of 2017, it was responsible for 60% of the world's spam. The world was responsible for it. Now, we're looking at weaponized botnets. That means that they can do a lot of destruction, and they're only meant for harm. Mirai Botnet was definitely the one that comes to mind for me. They were responsible for the 2016 DIN cyber attack that kind of took down the internet for a couple hours. At that point, they had 11.3 million unique IPs. A massive botnet footprint. Then we were talking about data theft. You're probably thinking to yourself, don't they all steal data? Yes, but this botnet was specifically stealing SSNs and data bursts. They were able to pop a LexisNexis server and were selling records individually. They sold over 1 million records individually for $5 a piece. Pretty decent, right? So then we're going to talk about click fraud. Now this is one of the other things that a lot of people uh, understand, but then they're not quite sure how it works. What you're doing here in click fraud botnets is the botnet will go out and it has an ad that's supposed to target. It will watch that ad 10,000 times that day. That ad is then making money because it's being shown, it's being clicked on, it's being you know, relevant to the, you know, to the uh, end user is what it sees. 3DE botnet had 700,000 active bots and it had 1.7 million unique IPs. It was able to push three to 12 billion ad views in a single day. That's a lot of money, all right? That's, that's a lot of money. Well, then we start having to talk about resource utilization bots. And when we talk about that, we're talking about your miners, your crypto miners, sometimes your blockchains, sometimes your tour nodes, where they will, a bot will come in and just make a tour node. You know what I mean? It just needs your resources. It doesn't need to do really anything else. And when we're talking about that, we really see miners overall. And the Jenkins miner had over a million bot miners and in one year, collectively, made $3 million in Bitcoin, which is pretty solid. Now, Emotet Geodo is a hybrid of a lot of these. It's weaponized, it makes a lot of money off data theft, and then it also can propagate certain ways that uh, other threat operators want that infrastructure. So they'll put their payload on top of Geodo's payload, and they get paid by that as well. So we're going to go over that. I've said it a couple of times, Emotet Yodo. What is it? All right, well, there are actually two different variants of the Yodo botnet, okay? But they're so unique that we conflate them so much, it's hard to pull them apart. They have such subtle differences, it's not even, it's not even like fair to call them two different things, but they are. I, sometimes I wonder if we're just labeling things in security, just to label them, you know? Uh, but, so, what it is, it's a banking trojan. Uh, it, it is very rapid, it's very modular, it's polymorphic in nature, which means that each and every download is changed every time. So antivirus signatures can't detect it. it it's very small base, so that ADs will see, oh, well, it's not really doing anything. It has really no uh, perceptual uh, resource utilization, it's just calling out. So we'll allow it. Well, it calls out, it pulls down a module, that module steals financial banking stuff, and you're already on the go. You know, you already have an infection in your network. The, uh, it all, like I said, it harvests and exfiltrates sensitive information. It downloads and, and or drops other malware. They found that if they can drop this banking trojan on a client, steal that financial data, that's money there. But if they can also bring a second party to it, they can get profit off that too. Pay me to bring you to the party, and I get money by getting there anyway, that's a lot of money. All right, so we need to talk about your botnet architecture, and there are two main ways, the only ways, there are two main ways that we see it in research and development of a botnet. And the two main ways are your peer-to-peer -peer model, and that's the Mirai botnet. That means my neighbor gives me instructions, I give my neighbor instructions, and there's really no single point of failure. It's really hard to stop because once it's going and it's rapid enough, you have to get way out in front of it and break it off. <coughs> it's pretty nice. The problem is it's not very manageable. 
threat operators can't manage that. If they send the command out and it's still propagating through their network, they can't stop it and send another one. They have to wait until it fully gets all the way out. Client server model is another way of uh, botnet architecture. This is what you guys are mostly familiar with. You have your threat operator, you have your C2s, you have your botnets. One, two, three. They're just different layers. Uh, Emotet Geodo is a client server model, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So when a botnet is actually connected to the C2, it is a botnet. When the infection is not communicating to the C2, it's not a botnet. It has to make that refrigerate call home. <coughs> a lot of these are just the one heartbeats, hey, I'm here. It just makes the C2 aware of its existence. A lot of them don't steal information on the first, on the first get of communication, because that exfiltration will be alerted on. Because when you make the connection and you're sending a whole bunch of packets at something that you've never made connections before, that firewall will go, all right, hold on. What is this? And it's going to look at it, it's going to break it down. So what they do is they say, hey, I'm here. PNS request to 8.8.8, .8 .8, port 808088, you know what I mean? And that's all it is. And they're going to go, okay. Well, a DNS request means that if it hit me, he's actually there. And there was no information exchange. This is a DNS query. And they're going to go, all right, you're, you're alive, and that botnet is now, or that bot is now effectively within the botnet. They do that a lot in different ways. On the left-hand side, you'll see the older ways that are still tried and true. On the left-hand side, you'll see, or on the, my, sorry, your left, my right, sorry. Uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see like the newer protocols that are used within tandem or laid over some of the older ways of going on to it. Now, the dynamic DNS is common because you have the ability to jump IPs and still have the domain hard-coded within the box. All right, so if the domain is, you know, aaronreilly.dns.net and the IP is fluctually changing, I don't have to change the IP in the botnet. They already have the hard-coded domain and they can get to me wherever I need to do. So I can stop your IP blocking. All I have to do is just do dynamic DNS. Then you know, there's other things that can happen. Seed lists are hard-coded lists of C2s within the binary. So it'll iterate through each and every C2 until it connects to one. And then it'll go, all right, that's the connection, they'll stay there. But a lot of times that botnet, the C2 will tell it, hey, move down two, and we'll connect there. Move down three, and we'll connect there. Your next instructions come from the fourth one, and we'll get there. So you'll hit a connection, sure, <coughs> and it might be just two attempts. But that's to say, hey, I'm here. Their response back says, move to channel two. You know what I mean? Move to channel one. It's kind of like, uh, I like to equate it to truckers on the highway, where it's like, move to frequency 11, we'll have a private conversation. You know what I mean? Like, it, it really is one of those kind of funny communication things. Uh, instant messaging. I don't know how a lot of enterprise networks allow instant messaging to go through the internet. I just don't understand it. We, a lot of Macs will allow for text messages and stuff to go onto the Mac from your phone, that way or the other. And it kind of negates a lot of filtering uh, on the network. And uh, I don't know if you've seen SMS phishing or phishing, however you want to call it, but it is a vector now. And people are sending those links to Mac address or to Macs that have that text enabled so that when they click on it, it affects the Mac, not your phone. So it's, it's pretty in, in, ingenious. Now, how does Emotet and Geo communicate? So we talked about different ways of communication styles. We talked about uh, the old protocols, the newer protocols. We talked about the architecture. Now, to put it into perspective, Geodo is a multi-tiered C2 structure, which means that the threat operators <coughs> have multiple C2 layers. Those are all segmented off. They don't actually talk to each other. They have different strains. They have Epoch 1 and Epoch 2, all right? And they are used indifferent. They never share the same C2s. There are four layers of server C2s in between, and those all communicate via the Tor node. So you don't know what the endpoint to endpoint is. It's always just flipping through, okay? Really hard to nail these guys down. Once they have their C2s up and going, then they have what they call uh, rank bots. So you'll have a bot that's the base bot, that is just a pure infection, there's no modules attached to it. That's just the, the base bot, I, they have like zero as a number. I call them privates, you know, and then sergeant, major, and all these different things are moving on, that's just me. Uh, it helps me organize them. But they do that so they understand, well, this private hasn't given any instructions. If I give it the financial module, I'll move to a sergeant, and it's now making me money. You know what I mean? And that's how they organize. The C2s in the multi-layer 
pull those down and segment them out and it inside themselves. So Epoch 1 will have two strains inside. One's delivering a second payload for profit, the other one's not because they didn't pay for it. They'll literally go, all right, threat operator number two, you want how many bucks? I'll segment that off for you. You don't get the full thing, you get what you pay for. They're very, very uh, adept at what they're doing. So the direct to sockets is only for the Emotep Geodo C2. We'll go through the chains of infection of how it gets to the uh, client, but the C2 is a direct to IP port, which is a socket communication, which is kind of ridiculous because all networks should be stopping that. You shouldn't allow your endpoint just to go to some random IP over a certain port. Uh, then once it's kind of down and on there, it pulls for instructions from the seed list. We already talked about how it does the seed list. But then what we're doing here is pulse for instructions saying, do I get this module? Do I get that module? Can I grab this? The attempts are so small, one to two, they don't cross your network threshold alerting systems. Because who's gonna alert on two attempts? That's so many false positives, it would just drive you nuts, and they know this. So they do one to two attempts, then move on. One to two attempts, then move on. So they're really skirting the fine line of what's going on. So propagation, like I said, this is the ability to spread from one <coughs> client to the next client, okay? And there are two main methods of doing this. You have your passive, which is end user enabled, which means I hand you, you know, something bad, and you go, all right, let's play with it. You open it up and just click, double click and have everything going. That's passive, it needs the end user to open it up. It needs, every, uh, it needs an interaction to go. Uh, an example of this, is uh, opening an executable or opening and executing the malicious attachment. But we'll talk about how Geodo does office macros or PDFs and what those look like. Uh, active is actually the binary is enabling it. This is typically lateral movements. Uh, Mariah Botnet would brute force any IoT device with a common list of username and password that's found on the internet. It would just brute force it, log in, uh, compromise it, then move on to the next device. And it was doing it automatically. There was no user enabling. Uh, and like I said, it's a lot of lateral movement on the networks, and we'll talk about what lateral movement is in a second. So how does our Emotet Geodo proliferate? How do they get uh, across the network? Uh, they first have a, and first and foremost, they're a passive propagation. They need the user to start it. But once it's started, it'll run on its own. It, it, once it, it's infected, it's like one guy getting a flu in the house, the rest of the house is going to get it. As, you know, as long as one guy has it. So the passive propagation is sent by spam. A lot of times they're links or they're PDFs <coughs> with uh, links inside them. The Office macro, they're laid, Office macro laden documents, so it could be an XLS, it could be a DOCX, it could be other things as long as it can enable a macro. And they're often chained together. So you're not gonna see just the Office macro and then the payload. You're going to see a link to a PDF. The PDF has a link in it that goes to the Office Macro. The Office Macro downloads the payload. Why? Because they're testing your security measures. They don't want to give you the payload if they're going to bust it right away. You know what I mean? They're not going to give all that resources and you know experience and that payload up if it's just going to get blown out of the water. So they do chains and steps. Uh, the threat operators have the C2 infrastructure in box that have delivered other malware, like I've said before. And TrickBot is another banking Trojan. Why would one banking Trojan bring another banking Trojan? They look for two different things. TrickBot is a point of sale banking Trojan. It's, most, it's supposed to be on cash register. All right? So if Geo can get you into the grocery store network, and TrickBot can find the point of sale, why not? You don't need to get in, you don't need the C2 infrastructure, you just need to build the binary. That's fine. The thing is, Geodo gets all the information you need as well. So when TrickBot gets its information, Geodo goes, I want a piece of that too. So they, not only do they get their information, they get whatever information they bring the second party to and what they got. It's pretty interesting. And then they turn around and they sell it uh, pretty well on the black market. Uh, the modules for instructions are uh, code that it calls down. It could be a code snippet. It could be literally just a text file that tells it what to look for. It could be a string of bank uh, names that we'll see in a minute in the processes. Uh, you'll see a lot of those. Uh, after the initial call out though, it will uh, attempt to spread laterally if given the command. Like I said, the rank. So certain ranks, if you give a call to scout, uh, the scout moves laterally. And if it gives that module, the scout will then take the credential set that it found on the computer. 
It will look at the network and then find a neighbor, take the credential set it stole, throw it at it, and go, hey, did I log in successfully? If I did, infect this machine. And then take those credential sets and try to find somebody else. That's what it's doing. It's just trying to brute force credentials on the network. It's pretty simple, but it's also one of those needed things for test. Uh, then, but the main thing I wanted to bring across is that when the modules do come down, they're very, very small. So the call has two attempts, the module's very small, it's evading everything on your AV, it's evading your network uh, alerting because of how small everything is. And that's what they know. These guys are, the threat operators here, uh, I like to attribute out of Russia, and they seem to have a lot more resources than normal threat operators and they understand antivirus detection a lot more than some of the other botnet operators. It seems that they understand that if I go small footprint, pull down small heartbeats, pull down, you know, or have small heartbeats, pull down small modules, I won't get detected because they're looking for the big package. They're looking for everything all in one, and they understand that. <coughs> now, how the, when we're talking about how Pumatech gets to the client and the chains of infection, we need to talk about how it actually uh, pulls the payload down. Like I said, it does it in steps. The first email will have a lot of subject lines. Uh, none of them are like that. That's a feature on one of my favorites. Um, the emails will always be financially triggered. So it'll be something like, your bank has been withdrawn so much. Uh, your, uh, the other one is, uh, your $1 million bank account being closed. Who would do that? Why are you clicking on it? Do you have a million dollars? Like, what's going on here? Can I follow that already? I don't understand. Some of these subject lines kill me. Uh, and then, so once the subject in the email gets there, it has a link, PDF, or within that, uh, within, if it's not a PDF, it's an archive. But in the archive, it's an Office macro laden document. The Office macro actually then runs PowerShell, runs enabled. PowerShell then runs a small bypass, uh, bypass policy execution script, which means that it bypasses all your security policies, and downloads binary, all right? And that's the URL. It contacts an actual URL, so it avoids your URL filtering if you're allowing, if it avoids the direct to socket filtering, it avoids a lot of the URL filtering if you're not doing certain ways of extension this binary downloads, so that's what it does. It calls out to a URL, slash, string of letters, nothing else on the end. All right, that comes down as a headerless binary. There's no MZ on it, all right? Once it gets to the memory, the geodo infection goes, all right, I'm gonna slap an MZ on it, dot .exe, throw it in the temp, and run. Also a your antivirus. Antivirus looks for an MZ header. Okay, another way of, of uh, bypassing. So uh, when I talk about the Office macro, they have before switched to JavaScript instead of an Office macro. We believe that was a testing of their infrastructure and a testing of another way that they can get profitable action through their botnet. It didn't seem to work very well because JavaScript typically doesn't run uh, in a lot of enterprises by default. It's, it's turned off in certain areas. Uh, so it didn't quite work out for them. So they moved on. The optional secondary payload we've seen a lot. The one that was just killer was ransomware. It brought Ryuk ransomware with it one day, uh, and it only did it for a day, uh, and it was just devastating enough to Brazil that uh, they had to do certain mitigation tactics to the Brazilian government. Uh, it was pretty interesting. Uh, I thought I would love to get down there, but I don't like playing with ransomware. It's one of those hard things that um, stop. Okay. So when you're looking on your network, and you're trying to find one of these zombies, and you want to, you know, uh, make sure your network's pretty resilient to these things. We need to talk about alerting. You need to have your host-based alerts, you need to have your network-based alerts, and they need to be sent and driven. They need to be automated. You don't need to have an alert fire to an email, and then hopefully somebody reads that email. You need to have an alert fire as an instant message, and then have like another alert right after. Did you get this? Did you get this? There's slap bots that'll do that. Hey, this alert happened. Have you? Have you this? Yes. All right. And then your managers can understand that that alert's been taken care of. You need to have these things on an ongoing basis. To be effective with your host base, there are a lot of products out there that do operate uh, entire operating system monitoring. Uh, I won't name them, but they are very good. I've played around with them quite a bit. They allow you to do a lot more than just quarantine and look at it from an outside view. They give you what's going on in the operating system. 
we're going to go through some of these tools that I have up here uh, and what I use them for. Your packet analyzer, I typically use Wireshark. This can be your SIM. It really can. If you have pretty good logs on your SIM, this can be it. Uh, I like to have the packet analyzer between the client and the gateway because if you have it outside the gateway, what's that gateway blocking it? Are you seeing everything? So I like to have it right there in the middle. Uh, your process analyzer, this is on the client. I use Process Hacker. We're going to see why this is really, really important. Uh, you can do this with the entire operating system monitoring suite, but this gives you a better view of what's going on. And then your protocol analyzer is actually kind of a afterthought. It's one of those things that once you've remediated things, you need to take it and kind of <coughs> scan your computer to make sure you've gotten everything and it has to have a root kit that will redo the infection after you've remediated it. So now that we have some tools and we have some understanding of what a botnet is, we need to figure out what kind of zombie it is. And I'm not talking attribution of Mirai or Geodo or Hematech. That's not really helping you. What's helping you is, is it financially driven? Is it weapons based? Is it just a click fraud ad? Because if you understand the generic types, you understand how to remediate those better and what it's looking for and what resources you need to go and block or set or mitigate earlier. Uh, and so when we're looking at this, the packet analyzer is one of those things that I said shows the network traffic. That's great. Uh, it also, oh, okay. So if, when you're looking at the tra network traffic, you need to cross-reference between what is noise, what is normal, and what is abnormal. What do you know, what is the unknown, and what is the, un or what is the known unknown? And so you need to go through and kind of compress and find that weird, irregular network traffic. And by doing that, you need to be right there, like I said, from the host to the gateway, right in between. The process analyzer uh, gives you insight of the network traffic coming from the machine, yes. It gives you shot validation. It allows, yes, I see on the outside of this machine that is calling out to the C2, what process is doing that? Is it a normal process? Is it the browser? Is it a PowerShell? Is it SVC host? Is that a normal thing? So when you're looking at the process analyzer, there's network tabs on a lot of these, and Process Attacker has it. And the network tab will show you what process is calling out to what uh, resource. All right, so then you take that and you go into that process and you dump the memory streams. Once the memory streams are dumped, you can look into it and say, is it financial? By pulling banking streams. Is there a Bank of America in there? Is there a Google Wallet, Bitcoin miners? All these types of things. It'll have streams in there to tell you what type of botnet it is. It really will. All of them do. It's really hard for them not to because if they don't, then they can't utilize the resources they need. If they're, you know, high CPU cycle, if it's in the browser and it has XM, XM minor uh, wallet location, then you know it's a crypto miner. There's all sorts of things that you can do. Uh, and then, like I said, it's shot validation. You see it on the network, you see it from the process analyzer. Is this process, what is it doing? Okay, we have an infection. All right, now that you have an infection, you need to look at the protocol analyzer. Like I said, it's kind of a remediation thing. You need to look at it and go, all right, I understand that this network traffic's bad. I stopped all this other network traffic. I've quarantined it. I need to remediate it. What did it do? So you take that protocol analyzer and you scan the computer. Did it open up an RDP port? Is there, because these ports that are open are not going to show on the network traffic if the network's not going over it. All right? They, I've seen botnets open up ports all day and not use them. Until later on, logically, it's told, I use this port now. And it already opened it. So why not protocol analyze and say, that port's open, why? Is that needed? Is this a second channel of communication? Or is this a back door? So those are the reasons you really need to kind of go back afterwards and take a protocol analyzer to your machines. Now, a bit viewer is kind of an optional thing. I know it's only on Windows. Uh, and there is kind of a Mac-like thing. but. Uh, a big viewer is an optional thing. It really only gives you evidentiary or uh, evidentiary. It only gives you slight understanding of what's going on. The logs within their system application and security are not very detailed on default. So if you want to uh, make those logs very detailed, you're going to have a CPU hit on your client, and that's not what everybody wants. They want a fast moving client, so they pull those down. So what you can do is you can say, all right, well, at this time, she said she opened up an email. She said it went to work. All right, on the event viewer in the application, Microsoft, off, Microsoft Office, it opened at this time. Well, then PowerShell ran right afterwards. As you can see that in those event zones. Okay, all right, now I can explain what's going on. Or JavaScript apps ran, or a VBS script ran. 
You know, you can see what applications all of a sudden open. You can't see the commands they ran. You can't see what they were doing or connecting to. But you can see they started. So it kind of gives you a, a trail of what we're doing and what we're looking at. Uh, so well, like I said, application plus the timestamps is definitely what you need for an event viewer. So when we're playing with zombies, and I like to do this a lot, I have virtual machines that I invest and I just play with them. Because uh, it's kind of fun to type things out and see it in the system memory as it's trying to exfiltrate it out in base 64. I know I'm a nerd. All right. So uh, there's a couple things you do and there's a couple things you don't. Quarantine number one, don't care. I do care if it's the CEO. I called him. Why do I quarantine? Done it. I had the commissioner of the state used to work for the stock uh, at the state of Missouri, and I had the commissioner get infected by a drive-by. His, I'm quarantining his machine. Have him on the phone. He's like, my machine's going nuts. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. Yes, and that's me. <laughs> and I'm sorry. <laughs> so it is one of those things. Do it, but communicate effectively to the end user. They are your biggest asset of what happened, what's going on. If you don't treat them like a a uh, bad person or a threat operator, you treat them more of a victim, they are more likely to tell you the truth. You don't come down with, bad, 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 what'd you do? No, mm -hmm. then you just come, all right, so what happened? You know, mm -hmm. so it's one of those things that the more you talk to the end user, the better uh, of a communication and a better maybe <coughs> uh, when it comes to educating them. Now, uh, opening a computer, like I said, is optional, but having admin credentials is one of those things I don't think a lot of people, uh, a lot of help desk techs or the communication techs understand when they get there, they're gonna run a lot of admin creds or admin processes and things like that. I've had a tech come to a, a, satellite, um, a satellite office and he wasn't given admin credentials, he wasn't given any of that, and he was supposed to uh, wipe a computer, uh, re-enable the port and give the end user back all of his credentials after resetting them. And I was like, how are you supposed to do that? He's like, I don't know. <laughs> so, all right, this is a problem. So we just didn't realize that that was something he needed, or he didn't realize that. Now some of the don'ts here, these are big. Don't leave it access to the network. I've seen a lot of that. I've seen a lot of people block it at the router. That's fine, but it's VLAN to all these other computers. Do you want to wipe 13 of them, or do you want to wipe one of them? You know what I mean? It comes down to don't leave it network. All right? Uh, you also uh, don't want to shut down the client because you're going to lose a lot of process memory. You're going to lose all that memory. It's just going to be gone. Don't close the browsers. Don't close any of the applications because you're going to lose that memory as well. Like I said, the process memory, you can see what they're doing and what's going on. Even the end user, you can see what they're doing from a, uh, a perspective of the strings and what they're utilizing resource-wise. So don't close them. Leave them up. And if you have one of those operating systems that monitor or uh, mon operating system monitoring security suites, take a snapshot of the image of the machine while it's infected because then you can pull a lot more things off of it, scan the files uh, that weren't backed up, you can play with it a little bit longer and give the end user back their machine, you can do a, a, a root cause analysis that we'll talk about in a minute, you can do all sorts of things. Oh, don't forget about the end user, all right? If, if I would have forgot about the commissioner being quarantined, it would have been a bad day for me, all right? Don't forget about it. So now that we understand the architecture, now that we understand the propagation style, now that we understand what an infection is and what it looks like, what is Giotto's science? Right? What does it look like when Giotto is on your network? Like I said before, we have the direct to sockets after the infection. We have the extension of binary downloads for the infection chain, okay? Uh, we have all sorts of other lateral network scan attempts and different things that are coming over HTTP traffic on other ports, which means I've seen HTTP traffic over port 20, uh, over ports over 1024, and I don't realize why. And on your network, if you have HTTP traffic not going over port 80, that's the number one alert. Just have an alert. Why not? Is there anything really supposed to be going over port 80 that's not HTTP? Or is HTTP supposed to be going over another port that you standardize on? That's great. Just have an alert if it's not. Okay. In the process memory streams, like I talked before with Process Hacker, you're going to see a lot of financial driven information. You're going to see uh, bank data. So if you've ever been to any of your banks on your web browser, it goes into the web browser, steals all that history, all your credential set, and then brings it back down. All right, I have a VM that has been to 50 banks websites. It has entered 22 credential sets, which are all fake, and they're really funny. Some of them are like George Washington and stuff like that. And every time I set off Kyoto, it grabs every one of them 
in five minutes or less, and then it's trying to exfiltrate that, that information back out. It's crazy. Okay, so the, uh, the network traffic, the basically for encoded cookie value is a big key. The reason it's a big key is because it's not requested the cookie. It's literally got a cookie value from nowhere, and it's handing it to someone on the first communication attempt. That's not right. That's typically not how web services work. You ask for one, they give you, you authenticate, back and forth. Now this guy goes, I'm bringing my value to the party, and he slaps it down. That base 64 chunk is the fingerprinting of your machine. It has your operating system, it has your username, your credentials, your IP, your geolocation. It has almost everything that will let you fingerprint that machine. Which also brings us to another thing, alert on fingerprinting. If PowerShell is asking for all these things about your machine, that's something you should alert on. That's host-based, and it's CPU cycle driven, so I understand if you're not doing it. Okay? So, like I said before, the process memories, you're going to see a specific uh, Mozilla user agent. It always keeps up to date with the <coughs> user agent. When Mozilla has updated itself, they're right behind and updating itself as well. It's pretty interesting. The socket seed list, you will see that in the process memory, so you will see all 50 socket seed lists. It's pretty cool. Take them, block them, it's great. Uh, then with the persistent file placement, it's going to put it in the temp, like I said before. Then it puts it in startup. Then it puts it in program files. Then it tries to get a rootkit if the module allows it to. There's a module, there's a rootkit module, and that's captain, is what we call it. And he, he pretty much calls the shot because he's pretty, he's pretty high up here on the ranking of files. So when we're defending against these kind of things, what do we need? Uh, we need to understand how the botnet works, how it communicates, how it propagates. Uh, we've already talked about how Geodo uh, does its uh, propagation, how it infects and everything like that. So these are some of the mitigation things that we talk about when we're uh, saying against a botnet of generic type, how do we mitigate it? Uh, the host base is the best, I feel, because you're right there on ground zero when it comes to the zombie infection. You have the best chance of mitigating it right there and stopping it. I believe end user education is one of the best to stopping uh, emote testing uh, because of the propagation method that it has. Uh, you can also uh, put DLP on your endpoints. I don't know how many people have a DLP program, but it's pretty, it's pretty great. You can set certain information to be sensitive. It doesn't have to be what is already known as sensitive information. So if you say, you know, uh, this file that has just, you know, my name and it's a text file, that's sensitive. Anytime it moves, I want to know. You can set those type of things, which is really great. And botnets, when they go after it, they are just trying to move it, they're trying to read it, they're trying to, you know, execute it or write to it. If you have an alert on it, then you're great to go, you're, you're good to go with that infection and understanding when it happens. Network base is kind of the same as host, but we're going to get a little bit deeper because we need to alert on our SMTP and DNS and DLP. Like I said before, if it's just a DNS request and that's how the bot tells the botnet that, hey, I'm here and I'm alive, maybe you standardize on the DNS. Maybe you say my server is the only DNS server that is allowed to talk. And any other request and anything else is automatically alerted on. I don't know if you have those alerts set, but it's one of those things you need to do. SMTP is another one. Uh, a lot of botnets will exfiltrate their information via an email. But they set up their own email files. Pretty fun. They write it by the, via the terminal and has all that kind of thing. You'll see it in the process screen. It's not like they use Outlook or anything like that. It's already on the machine. Why not do it? Okay. So uh, then you have you can do all sorts of things with protocol analysis scans and web proxies. Web proxies is a big one for networks because it negates drive-by downloads. If you have a web proxy out there and you're going you know, surfing through the web and the drive-by download hits that web proxy, should be able to negate that. It should say, you know what, I don't need all of that. It shouldn't go to the client. And this is something bad. URL wrapping is another one that we'll talk about in a minute, and that is also negated with the use of web proxies. So now that we uh, understand how to mitigate them, we need to understand what happens, what we need to do when we find one. When it's in our network, what do we need to do? Uh, like I said, quarantine should be your first move. It should be automated. Uh, you need to tune your network to have the quarantine be okay if it's automated. Uh, when we first turned it on at the state, we were quarantining everybody. Right? Just <laughs> everybody. And it was just a hectic. So we turned it off and then started working back up. Uh, pulling snapshots is, like I said before, it's easy for you to pull a snapshot if you have the operating system security moderate suite. And what you'll do there is you pull a snapshot. You can do a root cause analysis, which helps you with your mitigation techniques later. 
You can also grab the files off that machine that wasn't backed up earlier. You can scan those files and then hand them back to the end user if they're clean. If they're clean, okay? I don't know how many times I've seen somebody just slap a USB in, grab it, put it on the USB, take the USB and slap it in a like, brand new white computer and then we're off to the race again and I get alerts and it's Christmas and I, <laughs> so, uh, so performing a root cause analysis, like I said, gives you a way to mitigate what happened to the end user, uh, how to stop them before and doing it, uh, uh, how to stop them from doing it again. Uh, the rebuild is one of those things that people are like, yeah, I understand, you just put an image on it and you're good to go. Yes, you are, but there are other things you need to understand. You need to make sure that the mitigated system, the root cause analysis has a mitigation plan so that this doesn't happen yet. If you tell the end user what happened, I opened up an attachment, what kind of an attachment, well, it's a dot 7z, all right, don't open those. All right, okay, that's the mitigation plan right there. It's pretty simple. But make sure you have one in place. Uh, and that's the end user remediation. And with end user remediation, you also need to do credentials. Uh, every time that they get in trouble or have an incident, they need to change their credential set. Every single time. <coughs> Uh, then, with the uh, very, when you scan and replace the essential files, you can release the end user, monitor what's going on. After the end user takes the files, let them play on their computer for 15, 20, 30 minutes to make sure that they aren't, you know, reinfecting their machine with the files, make sure that they aren't having a root kit that just, you know, with certain right clicks or left clicks it activates. There's certain things you can do. So watch it for a period of time, whatever feels good for your, for your shop then unquarantine it. Because if you do it before and the same users out there playing with files, they're gonna reinfect themselves and you're off to the races again. So how do we stop Emotech and Auto? We already know what it does and how it works and tool based to get to it, but how do we stop it? So we need to do a lot of things on the host base. We need to disable office macros, okay? But if you need office macros, disable power cell use by the generic user. Pretty easy. There's certain system tools that you can say are admin only, all right? And that's done by group policy <coughs> or it's done by system uh, system rules on the in, in point. All right. You can have automated alerting for uh, client fingerprinting, like I said before. That's a great way of saying, you know, something's really going wrong here. Uh, the network base, we're going to disallow direct connections to sockets, like I've said before. Uh, block system tool downloads. Uh, single login per, per credential set. Like I said before, they grab the credentials. They try and brute force with those same credentials on the next machine to them. If you have a rule set in your network that says this credential set can only be used on one computer at a time. Network access control. Has this credential set been used before? Is it logged on anywhere else? Can't log on here. Can't log on here. So it kind of stops the propagation of the spread, okay? But Emotet had some SMB exploits when it was available, and so it might drop back to an old and tried and true method. But if you can stop it from having uh, multiple credentials log on across your network, that's great. Now I understand, you're gonna have some service accounts. Some of the admins are going, you know, I have one account that runs on all these computers, that's cool. But understand that that service account is gonna be documented. So that when your SOC runs into a, a credential set that's trying to go across the network, they can say, is this a service account or not? And from there, they can make accurate decisions. Then we need to talk about your email attachment standards and security analysis. Like I said, you can have a policy, a business policy, I only handle zips, I only handle docs. You put it on your website. If you're trying to contact us, please put it in this specific format. There are a lot of businesses that do that. It's not a problem. What it does though, is it makes an easy decision for your end user. Did it come down as a standardized way I'm supposed to handle it? No, it's not. All right, they don't have to think any further than that, which is great. It stops the infection right there. Also, it helps when you're going through your logs of a security person going, well, that's not a standard, well, that's not standard, and you can point them out and pick them and grab them, and then you're off to the races even faster. Uh, URL wrapping is the, uh, when the email comes down, it is, has a link in it. The link is looked through uh, by the email security staff. That link is then wrapped with a, this might not be safe type of wrapper. When it's clicked on, the web proxy then goes out and grabs it, scans the website, scans whatever might be coming down from the website, and then gives the end user, yes, that's nice, okay, here it is, or no, it was bad, and you're not allowed to get to it. Then it'll alert, because you're supposed to take that you know, uh, link, block it, and do all sorts of things. It'll also tell you that the end user, what the end user was doing. You can go down and say, did it get to you? Was the web proxy fast enough? That's another thing. The web proxy isn't 100%. Sometimes it'll just go and it'll get so fast because it's overloaded that it can't block in time. 
So it's a great thing to have. It's a great thing to have locks off of as well. So like the three seashells from Demolition Man, you need to know about the three Ps. Okay? Now I'm getting a lot of weird stares about the three seashells. Look it up. <laughs> <laughs> right? So the three Ps are prep, plan, and practice. And it's it's one of those things that, yeah, I understand it, but do you do it? At the SOC, we didn't do it until three <coughs> years in. And that was because we weren't mature enough to get it done. The three Ps, prep. Okay? Uh, you need to have your networks and clients up to date. You need to have your antivirus all up to date. You need to have a baseline of both so that when something weird happens, you automatically know what the weirdness is. All right? You need to have backup, frequently backup. All your networks, uh, your router uh, configurations is something that people don't think about for backing up. Do that because if Mariah got into your router and screwed your router configurations, how hard is it for you to think, you know, 10 years ago when I put this thing in, you know, like, what are the commands that I run? It's one of those things, back that up. Have security measures and tools in place, this seems like a, a, a no-nonsense thing, but you would be surprised when we talk about communication channels on a network where there's that gap right here that you're not know if you didn't know 3389 was open on your network. You know what I mean? Are you looking for those protocol sort of animals? Uh, things like that. Now, uh, plan, have a document plan for response and remediation. Okay, we understand what that means. Have a documentation plan for network and client change. Because when your SOC is going through and looking at why this IP is calling to this, it wasn't doing it before, they can go to your network admin and go, what happened, what changed? Look at the change documentation. Okay, it's normal. Okay, it's not normal. Do you know what I mean? Change documentation is key for a SOC. Uh, have a disaster recovery plan and a work outage plan. This is one of those things that we practiced quite a bit when I was with the state. Uh, we did it once a year, and we would have role-based uh, role drills, which was really good. Uh, but we had to have them planned out. We had to know who was doing what, when it happened, and what was prioritized within that disaster recovery. Do I need to bring up the web server first, or do I need to bring up our uh, uh, our SMTP server, our, our email server? Which one do I bring up first? You need to have those prioritized within the plan. And practice, you need to do drills. You need to figure out your weak points. You need to do it over and over and over again. With those weak points, take them and prep your network for how to get a plan in place to mitigate it. Plan for that mitigation. Practice because the medication come into effect. These are the cycle that you need to go through when you're looking at your at your networks and what's going on with the botnet and how to make sure you mitigate what's going on. So this is it. This is the end. Thanks for listening to me. <laughs>
Oh yeah, they can always be added on the modular. The modular bonus can always be added on like that. They're always evolving. They're always changing things like that. So if it's a trend of reinforcing passwords with a different password guessing uh, technique, then it's easily enough to add to the bonus. When it comes to like IoT devices getting attacked by bonus, what are like the minimum or uh, technical requirements uh, for a device to have that? Is there really like network connectivity? Network connectivity and a high CPU. If it doesn't have a decent CPU, it's not going to get taken uh, because those IoT devices are typically only used for CPU utilization and for DDoS attacks, miners, or anything like that. If it doesn't have a decent CPU on it, I'm not going to say it won't be taken over. It's just not a high priority device. Uh, and to uh, secure your IoT devices, I like to, the ones that uh, the firmware won't update or you can't quite uh, remote control, or not remote control, you can't control a lot of its output, I put a Bastion device. Uh, out in front so that it takes all the security front off of it and it communicates with my IoT devices and I communicate with it and it has a security built in there and it kind of beelines off that segment of IoT devices. We are out of time, so both of us are going to want to take